Good morning and welcome to worship today to celebrate the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Um, it's good to be here with you guys. Pastor Rebecca is on vacation today, um, so I will be here with you and I'm happy to do so. Um, a word about communion today is when we get to that point, um, Paul will be up at the communion railing distributing the communion cups. Um, so that will be the only change of um, service for today. Please rise as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna and the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is the heart of the Holy
Our first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy. Now this is the command that the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God, God, charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy. So that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children, and talk about them when you are at home, and when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand, Fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning comes from chapter 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, which is past, or like a walk in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O oh Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your word be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. And our second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror, dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three are the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. In New Testament Greek, there are four common words to describe love. They are eros, philia, storge, and agape. Each of these words holds a different definition of what love is. Eros, for instance, is a passionate love with sensual desire and longing. Eros can be interpreted as love for someone you love more than the philia of friendship. Philia means friendship. Think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This type of love generally includes loyalty to friends, family, and community. The third type of love is storge. Storge is familial love, such as the love between a parent and a child. Lastly, there is agape. Agape love is different from all the other Greek names for love. This definition of love most often refers to a general affection or concern instead of the physical attraction suggested by Eros. In other words, an undeserving love. It is not passive emotion, but active mercy. It is marked by patience and generosity. Again, both acts are generated by the one who loves. In short, loving is a choice, not a feeling. The thing that makes the Gothic different than these other definitions is that it refers to a total commitment for self-sacrificial love for the object, object love. As Christians, we are called to love, agape love, those who we might not deem lovable, or give us those warm, fuzzy feelings. Agape love knows that God's love is a total commitment to us. And to understand the commandment fully, we have to acknowledge this love and obey God's word. What we see in the gospel reading today is a Pharisee who tries to catch Jesus off guard. He asks Jesus, which commandment in the law is greatest? Jesus' answer is classic. He tells the Pharisees that loving God is the first and most important thing. And to love God means to love all of God's people and creation. This commandment Jesus talks about is known as the greatest commandment. See, the Torah contains 613 laws, or mitzvah in Hebrew, that need to be followed. And the Pharisees were often known for debating the laws and which ones were more important than the rest. The Shema is also one of two prayers specifically commanded in the Torah based on our Old Testament reading this morning from Deuteronomy. The Shema is an affirmation of Judaism and a declaration of faith in one God. 
A Jewish person is obligated to say the Shema in the morning and at night. The first line of the Shema is from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and reads, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahab, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The key issue with interpreting this double commandment Jesus lays out before us is that we lose sight of the meaning of God's love. Our culture has equated love with intense emotion. To love is a stronger response than to like. And both are measures of a passive response to something outside of us. God's love is not passive and is not strictly emotional. The Old Testament reference many types of love too, but the love in Matthew's passage is similar to that of what we heard in our Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy, the love of Yahweh. This love is far from passive. It is the active response of the faithful person to the love of God. We can love with our hearts through generosity to God's people. We can love with our soul by worshiping God and praying for our neighbors and ourselves. And we can love with our minds, studying God's word and letting it correct us, enlighten us, and send us out in loving action to the world. See how these commandments are connected the greatest commandment and the second, which is like it? When we love God's people, we are always and at the same time loving God. They are inseparable. Surprisingly, sometimes our emotions follow suit and we feel a love of others or a love of God. But the feeling is not commanded. Only the action of love is commanded. In Christ, this we can do, even when we don't feel like it. Loving all is a massive concept. Each of us sitting here today has a different idea of what love looks like and how it should be expressed. Some of us might even take it a step further and have ideas on how the recipient should experience love. So when we talk about love, it needs to be Christ-centric love, having Christ as its center. This means, however, that it's going to inconvenience us. It's going to ask us of something that might make us feel uncomfortable. When we decide to love all, it's not just us traveling to a remote or impoverished country, but it's also about traveling across the street to our neighbor. It's about us seeing how our entire community can see and experience the power of God. Because when we truly experience the love of God, there is a mandate in our life. We are supposed to reflect this love to the people around us. It is easy for us to say, oh, I have done all of this over here or over there. But what about the love that makes us uncomfortable? For example, when you don't want to be part of a conversation with certain people or are scared of going to a particular group of folks and reaching out. This is the type of love Jesus is calling us to. As the body of Christ, what if we started to embody love like Jesus, who went to places where people said, you really shouldn't go there? We need to be controversial with our love. This means we have to turn the normal upside down, or in our case, the right side up. You see, this is what love does. It corrects the errors in society. If there was ever a time to embody this love, and for the body of Christ to rise to the occasion, 
That time is now. Take the parable of the Good Samaritan, for instance. We all know the story of how a Samaritan walks by and shows mercy and shows love. When Jesus asked the man who is a neighbor, the man responded by saying, the one who showed mercy. I firmly believe that when we start showing love in this manner, people who are not included in the story become a part of Jesus' story. We live in such a politicized and social tension environment. But Jesus is calling us to practice tolerance and empathy and give and treat everyone with the fundamental dignity of the human person. We face the challenge of loving people who look and act differently, and it is essential to recognize that all of us are different. Our classrooms and workplaces are often places where we encounter a wide diversity of people who are close to us and with whom we are constantly interacting with. Jesus calls us to leave aside our differences, implicit biases, and prejudices, and start replacing them with love. Jesus also calls us to question ourselves and our priorities in everything we do as we tend to overtake unimportant situations over the need for love. The message of Jesus is all-embracing and covers all of our relationships, from family to friends to partners and so forth. But it even goes further than that, as we are called to love the wider community. Here at St. Peter's, we have already done some of this work with collecting food and helping hand missions, creating Thanksgiving Day baskets, housing the undocumented immigrants during the winter months, just to name a few. But what else can we do? Where are we called to love the wider community? What opportunities have we met because we were uncomfortable, because we were afraid? What missions have we neglected because the recipients didn't look or act like us? As many churches struggle and continue to struggle from the pandemic, it does not mean that our work has ceased. Now is the time to reach out to others in our community. Now is the time to outreach and bringing the good news to others. Where is Jesus calling St. Peter's to be? Where is Jesus calling the wider church community to be? Where is Jesus calling you to be? Who is your neighbor that needs love? Author and psychiatrist Dr. Scott Peck wrote a popular book entitled The World Less Travel. In it, he notes that the first rule of love is to give attention. To love is to choose to pay attention to those whom we love, allowing who they are and what they think and say to be important to us. He outlines in his book that one of the most critical parts of paying attention is to listen. And perhaps you know this, but maybe you've noticed that when people listen to you, they listen intently, so it registers with you that who you are and what you think is important. You know when you experience it, to be paid attention to, to be listened to, is to be loved. So what if we use that understanding of love to guide us in what it means to love God? What if loving God with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and giving careful and personal attention to what is important to God, to listen to God? What if we allow God's thoughts to be the important truth as we seek to understand life and how we should live it? even on the days when we're feeling pretty lousy or sad. 
Loving our neighbors means not being silent when they are mistreated. Loving our neighbors means not looking away when abuse and oppression happen. Loving our neighbors begins with listening and empathy, but it must go further. Just as we would hope someone would come to our aid in times of distress, loving our neighbors means we must step up and step out. Many of you may be familiar with the phrase WWJD, what would Jesus do? When you read through the Gospels, we find that Jesus had very little time for those who oppressed others. When he did speak of them, it was not in kind terms. Instead, Jesus spent his time with the oppressed. He ate with those who were the outcasts in society. He lived out love for the neighbor by telling those who have pushed aside that God's love did not recognize oppressive social norms. He showed God's love by describing God's kingdom as one where the first was last, where the powerful found no power. So let us learn from Jesus. It's time for us to love and listen to those who feel powerless. While we cannot walk in their shoes because they've worn these shoes all their lives, we can be open to hearing the pain. We need to create opportunities to listen to each other and others honestly and with open hearts. We need to take concrete steps to ensure the voices that have been silenced are the ones we are listening to. We cannot take away years of oppression, but we can fight to end it now. That's where listening and empathy take root and turn into something real. When we go back and look at this greatest commandment, this idea of loving your neighbor as yourself is found ten times in the New Testament. And this is a central theme for Jesus' teaching and the basis of how the first believers began to live out the reality of being disciples and forming the church. Let me briefly touch upon what I said earlier and how love will make us feel uncomfortable and how we need to rise to the occasion. One of the challenges I mentioned is understanding that we have lost sight of the meaning of God's love. And in recent times, we have seen other ideas be lifted as truth. From the very start of our country, we have put a value on the color of someone's skin. We have deemed those with darker skin to be less. Even when slavery ended, the values and beliefs about human dignity and worth still were based on the color of a person's skin. Now, I'm not saying that those of us sitting here in the pews today or in the future listening at home believe this or personally contributed to this, but we have benefited from this. In recent years, we have seen acts of hatred and violence, and I'll be honest, I've had hatred towards me. I've been discriminated against. My identity lies with my Native American and Latina heritage, but that shouldn't mean that I deserve to be loved less or mistreated, for I know I am a beloved child of God. It is also no secret that we are one of the whitest denominations in the nation. Not because we do not have a message that needs to be shared, but we have not figured out how to live out this message of grace, love, and acceptance. We are good at saying the words, but we regularly fall short of bringing these words and beliefs into action. So, as we go forth as disciples into the world, there is a glaring light shining on the path that not all are viewed as equal that we do not always love our neighbors as ourselves. I leave you with what I hope for us as a church, both locally and in the wider community. First, I hope that while we do good work in our community, we continue to challenge ourselves constantly to do better and be better. Second, I hope that we can be a bold church 
not just proclaiming God's love and grace, but living it out in our actions towards our neighbors. Third, I hope that we can be intentional in our care for others, especially those most marginalized and tossed aside by society, because in them we see God. Instead of being afraid to ruffle things others, or being fearful and thinking that talking about loving those who don't look like us or act like us will cause more harm than good, we should strive to live out our calling as Christians and love unconditionally. When others refuse to be inclusive, I fear that their comfort is more important. I fear that we rather keep the status quo than be bold in our proclamation and action so that God's love and grace would be who we are as a congregation, both locally and in the wider community. Let us be true to power. Let us boldly proclaim that loving our neighbor means our black, brown, indigenous, incarcerated, poor, elderly, disabled, politically different, LGBTQIA plus neighbors. I challenge you all this week and in the days ahead to let others who are different from you know that they are loved. Dr. Guy Irwin is a member of the Osage Nation and president of United Lutheran Seminary. Dr. Irwin was quoted once as saying that we need to proclaim the gospel more forcefully and serve our neighbors more courageously. Let me repeat that. We need to proclaim the gospel more forcefully and serve our neighbors more courageously. Do you believe that actions of love fulfilled through Christ and the Holy Spirit are for everyone? Are you willing to let your actions speak this truth to others? While these questions may be challenging, Let us remember to love as Jesus loves us. Jesus saw our work and loved us in the midst of our messiness. How can we limit that same love today as we seek to love the church? Amen. Thank you.
With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all those in need. In your love, you speak to your Church. Give courage and the bond of love to all who gather in your name, that this love turn toward our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you create our earth filled with living things of every kind. Sustain the intricate connections among plants, insects, animals, and organisms we don't even know or recognize. Bless the work of scientists who help us extend neighbor love to the natural world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you guide with justice. Inspire leaders for truthful conversations and wise policies. That decisions are made for the good of all. On this day of independence in 2021, we give thanks to the men and women in the armed forces and wise lawmakers in our past who ensure that we are a nation born of an independent spirit and a love for freedom and justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you tenderly care for your children and nurse them to health. Bring relief to all those who need healing, hope, or restoration this day, especially Stella, Stephen, Peter, Bruce, Sandy, Jerry, Grace, Christina, Jackie, Steve, Teresa, Carol, Erin, Philip, George, Charlie, Betty, Phoebe, Jimmy, Barbara, Lynn, Franklin, Tim, and Judy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your love, you accompany us in life transitions. We pray for new parents, those grieving a loss, those who are retiring, and those embarking on new adventures. Lord, in your love, we remember those who were dear to us and now rest in you. Today we remember Ralph Lombardi. We give thanks for all who seek to reform and renew your church. Give us courage to live out your gospel, revealing your love until our days on earth have ended. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O oh God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace as you are comfortable. And now our stewardship thought for the week. God has blessed us so that we may be generous for God's sake. Now let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, 
You have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Jesus invites us to share the meal of his body and blood. This morning, our meal comes to us as an extension of our last worship as he hears. In his witness to the day of Jesus' resurrection, Luke writes that later that day, two disciples encountered Jesus on their journey to a though they did not recognize him. He writes, as he came near the village to where they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But he urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, left and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he gathered from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Gather into one of the Holy Spirit and let us pray. Have a father, who is in heaven, holy is in heaven. I will take the call. 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 I will take we forgive those who us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. the Lord the table with more than enough for all. All are welcome. And by the
We have received from this day a more than we can ever ask. Everyone nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with our own life. In your name we pray. Amen. There's a couple of announcements today. These five are ready to start July 6th over at Santa Meadow State Park. Worship's at 9.30. You can bring your hair, sunscreen, all that sorts of stuff. Um, and if you're unable to join us for these, you can join the Pastor Sessler and Zoom Bible Talk uh, over at Bible Presence in Port Salon. Um, other announcements we have as well. We have Rally Day coming up September 19th, and Pastor Adolfo is looking for volunteers. So I encourage you all to volunteer your gifts that you have been given um, and help out with that. Uh, lastly, we have the Eagle Scout fundraiser. Building a new closet and then fast and our best for this Eagle Scout project. Um, and he's raising funds by buying two car washes. So please help support him in this um, car wash of 93 at either July 10th or 24th. So get your partners so you can go get lost. Um, other than that, I'm going to be very pleased to be doing better than I understand. So a long process of healing and recovery. Um, but we do send her good wishes to her. Uh, my mom just had a meniscus surgery on her knee this past week, and she's at home doing fine. Um, no issues with that. She's up and about and ready to go walk in the winter time. So, with um, that being said, I think life is very evil to see God walking. The blessing of God provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us. We are fine now and forever. As we go out into the wider world, what is our mission? We are sharing the news of the congregation in Huntington, sharing God's love as we serve the community. Then go in peace. You are the body of Christ.